said, this is really cool, and I've got an ISP, and I want to run it using Tickle, but Tickle doesn't do what I need it to do. So he made Tickle X. And that was the first place that things like associative arrays turned up. Um, it had a key list that looks an awful lot like our Git. Um, and uh, I forget, uh, a lot of things that got you into the systems administration, file control, a lot of things that have moved into Tickle, and some things that are still just in Tickle X that are just really useful. So that's the old, that's the, the proven part. Um, more recently, Carl decided that he wanted to let people know where planes were. And um, he's done a lot of new stuff that shows up in Tickle Rivet. And his flight aware is what he's going to talk about. And what he's doing now that's even more cool with new Tickle, bringing us into the 21st century. So our keynote speaker, Carl. Great. Or just flip it off. Okay, it is on. Okay, All right, cool. All right, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Carl Leonbauer. I am the uh, one of the founders and the chief technology officer of FlightAware LLC, uh, which is a uh, flight tracking company uh, based here in, in uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, so not here, but uh, nearby here. All right. Uh, so let me give you a little history about FlightAware. So we founded it in 2005, so like eight years ago. Uh, me and two buddies of mine were all uh, pilots and hackers, uh, typical guys. It's the largest, uh, today it's the largest aviation website in the world. It's, um, uh, we have about three million registered users, we do about 150 million web pages a month, and um, 250,000 flight alerts. So, you know, a flight alert is like that the flight's going to be in or it's going to be on time or it's going to arrive in an hour or something like that. Uh, we're, we're a top 100 website based on page views, uh, less based on the number of users, but our users look at a lot of pages. So, I was looking this morning, we're around about like the 85th most popular site in the United States for page views, according to Marcast. Anything to look, if you doubt that. Uh, we have some really big customers for the data side, NetJets, Boeing. Air Inc., which is a company that the airlines formed in the 1930s to develop technology. And uh, they, they developed instruments and, and uh, data and all sorts of cool things like that. Uh, we have about 40 employees in Houston and New York City, and we have data centers in Dallas and Houston and London. Uh, the Dallas one is really kind of our backup in the case of a crash. And the London data center allows us to give good uh, performance to people in Europe, which is really important for us because about 40% of our web pages web page views come from outside of the United States. Okay, so uh, here's what the website looks like if you haven't ever been there. It's flightaware.com. Uh, we provide real-time flight status to travelers, to uh, aircraft owners, airplanes, and airports. Uh, we also provide data for other apps, like TripAdvisor is a uh, basically a competitor on, in the uh, uh, iOS and Android space and we provide data for them, which uh, makes me really happy. Uh, we localize the site into 15 languages. That was kind of cool stuff. It's all tickle from uh, front to back and top to bottom. And uh, the localization, it's all done through the website. We, we uh, invented a thing we call Rosetta. Uh, found this great website, proz.com, P-R-O-Z.com. If you want to do uh, translations, it's neat because the translators uh, have to pay like a dollar to bid, so you don't get any crazy people who can translate and remove native speakers of each language. And uh, I'm making a lot of clicking noises, aren't I? All right. Uh, here's like one of the views. Uh, many ways of looking at stuff on the website. This is uh, an airspace view up near Chicago, kind of uh, the Midwest. Uh, weather, we have many weather sources. Some are commercial that we can only show to certain few customers. Some are public. Uh, you see all these different flights here. And there's a presentation kind of like a radar display, like here's JetBlue 217, it's an uh, Airbus A320 at uh, uh, 14,000 feet and 360 knots going from JFK to Long Beach, California. Uh, it's a fun way to look at, look at stuff. It's not the way most people would use the site, but if you want to explore, it's a good way to use the site. Um, we collect at least one position a minute, but in many cases we get as, as often as every 15 seconds. Here we have an international flight from the United States to London to uh, Heathrow Airport. Heathrow is uh, very often clocked in, and the flights that go to Heathrow 
tend to be many hours in length. Uh, you know, in the United States, if they knew the weather was going to be bad in Chicago, they do a thing called the ground wolf, and you probably experience that. You know, we're sitting on the plane, and they're like, yeah, they told us we can't leave yet. Uh, the FAA likes that, and the airline likes that, because it's way safer and way cheaper for the airplane to sit on the ground, rather than, you know, being uh, kept out of the airport, kept out of a, a, an airspace that's too full. Uh, in this case, so they got to Heathrow, and then they had to hold for about 42 minutes, and you can see those beautiful holds, probably flown by the autopilot. Then they got released and, and landed at the airport. Uh, this is just a graph of our uh, monthly unique website visitors. So we started in 2005. Let me tell you a little background on that. Uh, we had gotten the data feed from the FAA, and just, it's a fire hose. So there's all this data, and we start trying to read the docs and trying to parse it, and we have this really, really bad website called flightaware.com, and it has no maps and it has no, no beauty and you know no style, but uh, you can <coughs> and, and track flights and do things like that. So we're, we're sharing that with uh, a few of our friends, and we're saying, hey, don't tell anyone about this, but go ahead and poke around and let us know what you think. Well, one day, somebody told somebody and didn't tell them not to tell anybody. And so they posted on the Microsoft Pilots mailing list and we had 500 registrations in one day. A lot of pilots at Microsoft. Uh, it turned out that was a, you know, we were like, oh my God, we gotta get busy on this thing. It turned out that was really a big blessing insofar as the, um, you know, we would have probably stayed in beta for a really, really long time and instead we were kind of rushed into production, which was awesome. Um, and, you know, you can kind of see the effects of the 2007 uh, you know, financial meltdown. We didn't grow really nearly as, as quickly as we wanted to. And then this year we've had a really nice sharp upward inflection, and that reflects uh, us getting really good coverage in Europe, in New Zealand, and in Australia. Uh, this is an example of one of our things in airport delays. We get from the FAA airport delays in the United States for the major airports. Uh, they actually provide both an XML API and uh, a web page. And then there's stuff on the web page that's not in the XML, so we parse the XML and the web page and work out what they're doing. And then for all these other cities, we make our own calculations of delays. We look at scheduled arrivals from the airlines and reports of where the flights are and look at how many flights are getting moved into the next hour, either for arriving and departing. That's pretty accurate. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of cool. Um, so, some new work that we're doing, uh, we call this thing airspace aware, but it also works for airports. Uh, what we've got here is the kind of scheduled flights and uh, actual, what, the, the background color here is the, uh, the conditions for the flight conditions. So there's VFR, visual flight rules, that means it's basically a clear sky, more or less. And you can see anything. Then it goes to the IFR instrument flight rules, where you have to fly the aircraft only by reference to instruments. It goes from there to, well, actually, MVFR is marginal VFR, but it goes down to instrument flight rules, where it's required instrument flight rules. Then a low LIFR is low IFR, and then finally, BCAT1 is below category 1, and that's where uh, only very specific aircraft with specific equipment and crews that are trained can actually descend to a uh, lower altitude and still make the landing. And so we can see here like some bad weather suppressing the activity on the flight. Uh, we're actually moving that into, we're, we're adding on to here the future. And uh, we're gonna make predictions about the capacity based on the weather in, in the future. It's really interesting stuff. And uh, what's interesting about it is, rather than, you know, kind of, so like airports, a lot of times will have many runways, uh, they'll have, uh, parallel runways along the way of the prevailing ones and the weather so they can land aircraft simultaneously on both runways. As the uh, weather deteriorates, they can't do parallel approaches, so the capacity of the air, airport drops. Then also, if the winds change, you know, in certain directions, they may only have one runway to use, and then as the uh, ceiling drops, they move into these modes where they can't land or launch as many aircraft. And so we'll be able to tell them, well, about 1 p.m. today, you're going to go from, you know, 120 aircraft per hour to about 90, then about 2 p.m. to 60, then about 3 p.m. to zero. Uh, they really like that. Uh, this is uh, some more technology. We call this the misery map. And it, uh, it lets you look at 
uh, flight delays where they originated and what they impacted. You can see time is moving here. Green are flights that are on time. Red are flights that are delayed. A lot of delays on this day. And you can see they're sourced considerably out of uh, O'Hare Airport. And uh, that's some work that uh, was done against all the data that we have and then some cool JavaScript uh, stuff to make the interactivity. Uh, we have mobile apps, all these different uh, things, iOS, Android, and then Blackberry, and Playbook, and Symbian, and Windows Phone 7, and stuff like that. So you can guess that. We know that iOS and Android are the ones that really matter. And uh, the other ones that uh, people paid us to write those. But we like having some coverage of the Windows Phone and Windows 8 because, you know, they the total is ready. Um, Okay, so, so a lot of our radar data comes from what are called ANSPs. It's an Airspace National Service Provider. So like in the United States, it's the FAA. In Australia, it's a company called Air Services Australia. In the UK, it's a company called NAS UK, um, and so on. And, and so in certain countries, we get data actually from the radars of the government, and in other countries, we don't. Um, a lot of aircraft have an ability to transmit their position via VHF data link or via satellite. And uh, typically, uh, the aircraft, there's called ACARS, which is their aircraft condition reporting system. And that, um, so basically, you know, every 30 minutes, this aircraft makes its report. It says, I'm at this position, I expect to be at this next position in half an hour, and I expect to be at this next position in an hour. And that's all sourced out of the flight director, which is like a very fancy autopilot that's in all the big planes. Uh, you can imagine like, you know, a company like Exxon, which has a corporate aviation department with some really expensive aircraft, and they fly to some really dangerous places uh, in Africa and things like that. So we really like to know where the aircraft are. Um, so there are these several companies that do this, and they are kind of all our tribals of each other. Uh, when we first started the company, nobody would talk to us or give us the time of day. Uh, now they do, and we have the credibility that uh, they're all okay with the deals that we're making with each other, which is really nice. Now, one thing about this data, since it's only every 15 or 30 minutes, um, you know, that's, that's not as timely. So when the aircraft's in the United States, let's say I'm getting a, every minute I'm getting a position on it, we synthesize with all of our sources um, to say where the aircraft is, and that's valuable to them, like airing direct. You should just have the plane somewhere, and then they would jump, jump it to the new place and jump it to the new place, and, we actually, you know, uh, in certain countries, then can move it as uh, in small steps. We'll talk about more that more in a little bit. Uh, and then there's a lot of different commercial. Things. Do I sound okay? Should I just go to? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so we do a lot of commercial data. Like United Airlines pays us. They want to look at uh, the ways that are introduced to flights by controllers. So an air traffic controller, it's obvious, you know, if the flight is making circles, it's been instructed to hold, but there are other kinds of delays that controllers can do. If, uh, let's say, this, this flight's on a heading of 180, it's heading towards Houston, Texas, and the airspace it's about to enter is full, and this actually happens frequently. So the controller will just call him and say, United 1972, you know, right heading 225, and so they'll turn him 45 degrees and let him fly for a few minutes, and then they'll turn him back and say, resume on course navigation. Uh, United wants to know that. They, so we generate this comprehensive report from the data for them and lots of stuff like that. Um, we also have some push technology. This is a node application. This is where I'm going to say a bunch of mean things about node today. But, uh, if you look at the website, generally you can, you know, we'll update the positions so the airplanes look like they're flying, even though generally we're not getting a position more than once every 15 seconds. We just kind of connect the dots and move the planes around. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this stuff. I just, I just put this slide in here to kind of show you a bunch of different products that we've uh, developed over time. Uh, we have an API called FlightXML that you can get online and get a free account and actually do some FlightXML and then add certain quantities. But you can make all sorts of API uh, queries that fire up uh, lights and, and positions and things like that. Uh, we collect all sorts of fuel prices. Some companies give that to us, others we have to call them. We make hundreds of calls every week to uh, 
help the others, which are like the gas stations of the China aircraft world, and to ask them how much is your how much is your jet fuel right now. Um, anyway, just a, a recent thing that's really cool. We we started a few years ago collecting photos. This is all sourced by our users, and you know we had this very grid arrangement and something. Like that. And one of my guys has uh, rewritten it to be sort of more flicker like but with really great performance. So it uh, kind of fits all this stuff in and you scroll through that and um, you can vote and comment and, and uh, it counts the number of views and stuff and then there's all these ways to view. A lot of people like pictures of airplanes like me. And in fact, I, I've looked at every single photograph that's been uploaded since uh, the inception. Uh, we've got some stuff coming out in October. There's a big conference called the National Business Aviation Association. Uh, there's a company, any of you guys pilots? I'm sure some of you are, right? I'm in a flight simulator. Okay, well, flight simulator. Okay, great. Anyway, there's, a, there's an, an application for ICAP called ForeFlight. It's really cool. It has all the maps and stuff, all the charts that you have to have. You've probably seen the pilot getting on the plane and hauling that big thing that's full of like 20 pounds of paper charts. And that was really brutal because then you get these updates and you have to turn to like page 1000 and replace one page and snap the rings together and then turn it again and the pages are really thin and they tear out. It's a big pain. It was hours every week of just maintaining your charts, maintaining their legality. Now it's all on the iPads. It's like eight dollars a month or something like that. And uh, I'll tell you, it's at a bigger part if you're taxing around in an airplane, it's really scary because you know, like you're like. You, know, you call the airport and you're like, yeah, so then I text them and try to pop over, we're here, we want to go there, and they're like, okay, take off the hotel, hotel over the bridge, cross one seven without the lake, you know, and they whip out 10 instructions that you're supposed to follow, and you've got to jot those down and you have to get them right, and if you make it, if you, if you turn the wrong way or if you cross the wrong way without the clearance, uh, you, it, you know, they'll just take your license and look for like, so it's, it's a big, you know, it's a big deal. Uh, these guys have geo-referenced taxi diagrams and stuff, so you can actually see. Some of the airports are scary. You know, it's really hard to actually tell where you are that you're on the right runway. It's a very valuable tool. So what you can do with the technology with our partnership is uh, file a flight plan either through us or through them, and when it comes back from the FAA, you ask for a certain route. Well, I want to climb this airway, I want to go from here to here, blah, 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 blah. They'll send back not necessarily the route you ask for. And then you have to enter all that into your gear. So now you won't have the little downlink that Rob the FAA gave you and uh, load it into your flight bag. It's kind of where the where the money comes from. It's kind of crazy, but it's ever since the beginning, 50% advertising and 50% data services. Um, this has actually been really worked out good for us. I think it's really hard to make a site, make a business solely off of internet advertising because the number of pages that are being advertised is constantly going up at a really high rate. Like when we got started, uh, the uh, lowest value ads are called run of site. You know, it's like we would sell, let's say we'll sell ads to someone who wants to hit aircraft owners. Those are really expensive ads. Those are like $30 per thousand impressions. You know, someone wants to hit pilots, that's like $10 per thousand impressions. But when you run out of those, then you're just handing off the uh, ads to Google and Travel Fusion and things like that, and your ad now may be 90 cents or a dollar per thousand ads. Eight years ago, four dollars per thousand ads. So there's a constant like deflation in revenue, and you have to like you know double your web pages every couple of years just to stay even. So the data side has a really good. Um, some of this is online, like you can get on and uh, do a lot for to sell you a report on an aircraft. A lot of guys were buying a plane, you know, you know. I'm, Considering buying a ten million dollar airplane or something and giving flight order a few hundred bucks to look at all the flights and say, hey, I thought you said you know it was this plane you flew to Mexico all these times. So what's going on with that? That's all completely automated. Then we have outbound and inbound sales requests and so. All right, the technology. Uh, this is a kind of a simple flight diagram. This really gives you the idea. This is uh, basically how we do flight tracking. So we have all these sources. ASME, that's the uh, FAA, that's uh, Aircraft Situational Display to Industry. We have redundant feeds. We have ADSB, that's a new technology that uh, is expected to be fully implemented in the United States in 2020. It's pretty fully implemented in Europe already, 
and it's, uh, it's GPS and radio based. It's kind of like Ethernet as far as uh, all the aircraft with this gear listen on uh, 1090 megahertz and they're broadcasting. Although it isn't collisions, it's they're just blindly broadcasting their position every so often. And um, you can, with ground stations, you can tell where the aircraft are. If you're in the aircraft, you can get traffic uh, messages and traffic avoidance. Uh, it's, it's the next big thing, ADSB, but it's not fully implemented. But that's a great source. And then those SATCOM providers. So we get these all sorts of different ways. One of the SATCOM providers actually sends us an email message for every update. That's the worst. Uh, the good ones will at least do like HTTP with REST or something like that. So now we get this stuff. The ASD feed is particularly arcane. Uh, you know, we'll have like a uh, ground speed. Ground speed's a knot. Great. Okay, well, ground speed's minus 82 knots. What's that mean? Oh, well, that's a mock airspeed, and then we have to look at the altitude and the air density and stuff to figure out the ground speed. Um, the ASD feed is XML, but it is probably a very ignorant implementation. That is to say, there's three representations of latitude and longitude, three different representations in their message formats. One of them is in minutes, uh, for those of you who are into that stuff. So, so we have these uh, feed conditioning programs that normalize the messages, for example, converting the mock, the mock speed into a ground speed, uh, normalizing the identifier of the aircraft, um, just fixing whatever weird stuff might be in that specific feed and so we get a pretty standard, like a position is generally a latitude, a longitude, a ground speed, and an altitude. Uh, a flight plan is generally an origin, a destination, a departure time, and arrival time, and it may include uh, just, you know, waypoints and all sorts of other things. Those all go together into the feed combiner, which, which uh, combines them in a sequential time order, and those get fed into the feed interpreter, which does all the heavy lifting. Uh, the deal is, like this as a feed, we might start getting positions before we get a departure message. We might never get a departure message. Uh, we might never get an arrival message. We might have an aircraft that took off in Europe, but when it enters the United States airspace, we don't get a message saying, Oh yeah, this thing's a cop in Europe. We get a thing like, oh yeah, this thing just they'll, they'll like generate a flight plan saying it, it began when it entered the United States airspace. So the feed interpreter tries to figure all that stuff out and produce like a sanitized feed where each flight <coughs> begins with a departure, ends with an arrival, some kind of arrival. It may it may arrive when we say we don't know actually what happened. Flight results unknown or fruit, as we call that. Um, but the point is then, anyone who wants to read the output of the feed interpreter doesn't have to do all the work that the feed interpreter does, inferring and making all these decisions, and then we have these consumers of the feed interpreter. So the, this program, Bacon, it talks to the uh, SQL database, we use Postgres as our database. Uh, Multicom handles the alerts, Bird's Eye is a real-time memory resident, kind of NoSQL thing for positions and all sorts of queries that are just way too frequent and way too high overhead for the database and then flight push, like that thing I showed you earlier where the airplanes are moving. Okay, I, you know, I'm not going to go into this whole thing in great detail. I do want to talk about a couple things. Uh, Daystream, this is, I think this is funny, temporal cloud technology for storing and retrieving terabytes of real-time data. What that means is a lot of this data is time-based. And so we have a lot of high-tech object that can write those things. And what it does then, it's like, oh, I need to, you know, here's this data, here's the clock. It turns the clock into a, a year slash month slash day uh, file name, and it appends to that file. Um, there's a catalog that knows where all the data is, and so then in your program you say, oh, I want to read the control stream feed, or I want to read the combiner feed, or I want to read the feed from direct direct, or I want to read the feed from this one ADSP site. And then if it's on your local machine, the object just goes and gets the data and starts feeding it to you. If it's on a remote machine, the object SSHs to the other machine and runs a program that wraps that same object and gets the data from there. So uh, that's pretty cool. And that is key to all of this processing technology. Feed um, Interpreter produces this output that we call control stream. Words I mentioned, 10 gigabytes of uh, RAM for the real-time position 
call it 4D because it has time and opposite and divided through the line. Also, we make a lot of maps and we make a lot of weather tiles, and so we have a lot of servers dedicated to that, and we have a program called the Balancer that all the servers check and look in the balancer of the sites. Who will make the map or who will make the weather tile? And it's more, and it remembers, and so it's like, oh, someone just asked for that. Here, let me give that to you again. Um, it's all tickle. Every line of the whole thing is tickle. Um, I want to talk a little more about the So we get out, So here's an example of, um, so this flight plan, it's an IDEN, UAL, United Airlines, line 72, an origin, Heathrow, a destination, intercontinental airport in Houston, a registration, which is the tail number, or the actual like, physical, Identifier, November 769, Uniform Alpha, estimated departure time, estimated time of arrival, and so on. Some, some we have more, some we have less, but usually we have at least an origin, a destination, and a uh, departure and arrival time. Then we get all these positions from all these sources. Um, none of these, almost none of these messages have any kind of unique identifier. And this is actually brutal. Um, for example, it isn't uncommon to actually have two aircraft operating with the same identifier at the same time. American Eagle is notorious for it, but it'll even happen, let's say, you'll, you'll see like a flight from London to <coughs> Chicago, and then a flight from like Chicago to Des Moines, and they'll both operate with the same flight numbers. It'll be like UEL 234, right? And so the, the trans-oceanic flight is late. It's really late. And it's a hub, so the airlines is like, all right, roll out another airplane, take these people to Des Moines, and then we have one aircraft like, you know, whatever, AAL-234, en route to Chicago, simultaneously AAL-234 en route from Chicago. And that is, that is really, really tricky. And it, and it causes a lot of havoc. So we, uh, we also wrote a thing called the, uh, the TETA discriminator, which is two in the air. And, uh, and so if, if, the, the, if the TU discriminator doesn't think there's two in the air, then we would say, okay, no, there's not two in the air, so these two, I'm going to wait on this other position, I'm going to see if I get another one there, and we can, because we do garbage positions and garbled positions and stuff like that. Uh, in the biz, they have this thing called O O O I or O three I. It's out, off, on, and in. Out is that they, uh, they, they're backing up or you know, they're leaving the gate, off, of course they're in the air, on, they're on the ground, and in, you know, they've parked at the gate again. And we get those messages left from the airlines. Uh, we match all that stuff together. Even if we have unique, like Eurocontrol does put a unique ID on their messages, which is awesome, but no other source recognizes that ID. So it's useful for tying the messages together from Eurocontrol, but we still have to do all this extensive like, heuristics and matching. And um, this was where I learned that about kind of fuzzy logic and scoring things and, and not trying to, you know, at first we were trying to say if it's this and that or this and, you know, and just do it straight with Boolean logic and it didn't work. So now it's kind of like, well, you know, that, that airplane is pretty close to the destination and you have, a, you have an aircraft in flight with that ID that should be pretty close to the destination. And, looking at this other flight, now that's from yesterday, I'm looking at this other flight, that's from tomorrow. Uh, this has to be it. Yeah. Uh, pretty crazy. There's a, I say do extensive work to disambiguate the noisy signals. It's it's a lot of human input, right? So the, the uh, air traffic controller is sitting there and he's like, he types in your, your thing, uh, N123 Alpha Bravo, and then he calls you, hey, N123 Alpha Bravo, blah, blah, blah. You're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm 123 Bravo Alpha. He cancels 123 Alpha Bravo, he creates 123 Bravo Alpha, uh, and so we kind of see these uh, brief, you know, flight plans that kind of get created and canceled, and we recognize that he didn't mean to do that, and and so um, all this all this stuff is happening all the time. The controller is also sitting there while the thing's in flight, you know, looking at his scope and going, you know, they have these waypoints, right? They have these little sort of roads in the sky. And uh, you know he's got a sense right here and then here, but he'll look and say, oh, I don't have any aircraft in that area. So he'll say to that guy, okay, proceed direct to your second wing one, stuff like that. We get all those messages we update. And they can save, on a long plane, you can save a lot of time when they're giving you those little shortcuts, just a few miles here and a few miles there. Uh, as I said, we generate, like, the, oh, this is cool. So on the, um, the alerts, you know, we generate these change messages, like if you're on the flight, 
you might, you know, we'll say, hey, you're turning out of, you know, gate 37 instead of gate 24. Hey, your ad claim has changed at your destination, things like that. Your meeting supply, you don't care about this. So when you set up the flight alert, it's like, oh, I'm meeting the flight. Okay, well, it's just going to tell you when the flight is an hour out and when it's arrived. Uh, another thing is when aircraft aren't moving, we move them ourselves with our software. So just like I said, like this, this thing says, oh, I'm here, I'm going to be here in half an hour, I'm going to be here in half an hour. So we'll just drive it once a minute, kind of move it toward that next position. Then when we get a real position, we kind of straighten it all out and fix it. We also uh, update, we make our own uh, estimated time of arrival calculations. And uh, this one is really, really tricky. Maintain multiple floors. So we have different data sources, like they're indirect. One of the things they're afraid of, they don't want anyone else seeing who their customers are. They don't want anyone else uh, getting access to the data. They don't want us combining that data with all this other data. So we actually invented and patented some technology for forking the flight. And so there'll be one version of the flight that has only public source, one version of the flight that has the public data and the airing direct data, another version that has the Euro control data because they have certain covenants with those for who can and who can't see it. And so we'll have up to 15 simultaneous flights with different sets of data that are constructing that flight. And it's it's pretty cool and it's pretty crazy because the, the, sometimes they get really far out from each other because the public source is just like, yeah, it took off. And, 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 the, and the public sources yet arrived. And so all we do is just kind of drive it on a green circle run toward the destination, but it's giving us this other data. Oh, I'm in bad weather, oh, I have to deviate, you know, blah, 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 blah. So we'll be, you know, the public data will be really inaccurate, and then some of the data, the combined data will, will be really cool. So the point is where we do all that, and we cache the checks. That's, uh, that's the last uh, thing on there. So. Uh, uh, again, here's just some examples of all the stupid stuff that happens. Uh, I won't go into all that, but, but just it's just crazy. It's like if you're flying, so there are controlled airports and uncontrolled airports. And a controlled airport, as you might guess, has an air traffic controller, and an uncontrolled airport does not. Uh, you can still conduct instrument approaches, meaning by reference to your instruments, you can fly to an uncontrolled airport. But since there's no controller there to say, okay, the guy's landed, they block out this airspace. And after you land it, then they'll allow another aircraft into the airspace. Um, they generate these bogus positions that aren't even real after the flights arrive. And we've worked out the algorithms for figuring out that it's not a real position. It's fun to see competitors, you know, the plane takes off again. Like that uh, Asiana plane that crashed in San Francisco a few weeks ago, uh, they generated these positions as if it had continued out over the ocean, and we properly disintegrated that. This is a great example of, of the tech. So these radars, every radar that sees the aircraft will report the position that it saw, but the radars that are the furthest away will be the least accurate. And we get these, we get some insane positions sometimes from northern Canada reporting on flights in the United States. And when we used to just accept every position that we saw, we would generate tracks that look like this. Uh, and we used to a little bit We used to a little bit not care. You know, we were kind of like, well, you know, it's pretty what you expect. Uh, now that you have people paying, can I just take this off and yell? You try the handheld if you like. All right. It's all that. You gotta be driving you guys, driving you guys nuts. Driving you guys. Okay, so let me turn it up. All right. Check one on chip. Check, 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 check. Hello? Lots of employees, all right. All right, um, you know, now that the, the paying customers don't like that attitude.